Namaste, and uh, I welcome you to this Wednesday 10 p.m. show. And today we have an exceptional panel here, and we are going to discuss the book by Sri Rajiv Malhotra, Snakes on the Ganga, and the co-author Vijay Lakshmi ji. And uh, of course, uh, as always, Wednesday 10 p.m. is never complete without Sri Vibhuti Jha. And, and uh, I have to thank uh, Sri Vibhuti Jha especially for uh, making today's talk possible. Uh, without any further ado, uh, let's move in and welcome uh, Rajiv ji, welcome Vijay ji, and welcome Vibhuti ji. So I go straight to Rajiv ji first. Rajiv ji, we find you're breaking India 2.0. Uh, I think it's uh, going to be launched in about 10, 15 days from now. I think yes. the 26th, 26th of September. Yes. And um, you've all been a fan of your Breaking India 1.0. Of course, it's known only as Breaking India, but now I think we'll have to rechristen it as a Breaking India 1.0 probably. So uh, why did you feel the need of writing Breaking India 2.0? Because uh, uh, do you think that uh, the theories or the tropes that necessitated Breaking India 1.0 have changed or morphed or mm, sufficiently altered themselves to harm India in uh, different ways? Yeah, the answer to all of these is yes. So let me explain. Uh, you know, the earlier Breaking India focus was uh, the church, because we followed the money, we, we looked at where in the original Breaking India, even in this case, followed the money, followed the ideology, followed the influence. And that, in the earlier case, led to the church as one big nexus, and it led to Dravidianism. So those were the two major areas. Uh, now it's a whole different game. People, uh, people today uh, who are at the frontiers of creating trouble uh, for India, whether it's Washington Post or New York Times or BBC, uh, it's not the church as much. Church has got its own mischief going on, but it is not in, in, in this case. Uh, and the people who are in the U.S. Congress, uh, you know, who are uh, they're ultra left wing people, not the church, uh, who are putting all this noise against India, the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom, even though it talks about religious freedom, but the people who are instigating it are not uh, the Christian church. So the, the nexuses have changed, completely changed. Uh, it's more like uh, the successors of George Soros. Uh, George Soros was there already, but uh, he is very old. In, you know, very, now there are new people. So now it is you have to ask why is the why are the billionaires, whether they are Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and uh, many others, uh, or whether it is the Indian billionaires, how come they have aligned themselves with the with the left? This is a very different phenomenon. So breaking India 1.0, you could see the manifestation in uh, JNU. Uh, where people came from the grassroots and there were the Jola Walas and they were they were creating trouble. They are still creating trouble. But you did not have Ashoka University or Kriya or uh, uh, the Premji uh, establishment or this Godrej Culture Labs, these private universities which charge high fees and cater to the elites of India. They cater to the sons and daughters of the Indian, uh, Indian uh, industrialists and the corporate elites and various people. This is a new phenomenon. So now the breaking India internationally is very different from the type of people who are doing it earlier. And we've identified Harvard in particular as the nest of snakes where they're developing all this logic and spreading it. And in the in India, the footprint of Breaking India 2.0 is also very different from the footprint for 1.0 because it's not the same old NGOs and JNU. It is these private sector uh, in, uh, you know, universities. It's a lot of industrialists in it. Uh, so the, the, the elites of India, the elites of India have been bought off. This is a very dangerous thing, very far worse than saying, okay, it's only coming from the bottom tier of uh, bottom strata in terms of socioeconomic. Uh, so that's why Breaking India 2.0 is a whole different ballgame. Uh, just to follow up on this, uh, you said that elites of India seem to have been bought off and they are probably the snakes along with the uh, snakes that you have uh, in Harvard and such institutions. But uh, I would think that the elites of India were always bought off. Is there there's something new today? Is there any difference? Yeah, I mean, the, the corporate elites were not into, this, uh, into, the, into the game until very recently. For one thing, they did not have such a large footprint. 
I mean, if you look at our chapters in under the part two, which is on Harvard, which talks about, uh, you know, different ind industrialists, each one of them gets a separate chapter. Those centers and departments found, found, funded by the Indian billionaires did not exist before 2010. So you're, we're talking about entirely new configurations. Now these guys have money. They did not, they were not the billionaires, you know, 10, 15 years ago. They've become billionaires. It's newly minted money uh, of the scale that has given them uh, a top position in the world ranking of billionaires. This billionaire phenomenon of India is a very new phenomenon. And now they have started uh, showing their wealth in liberal arts and uh, fashionable funding of Harvard, which was not something happening in the past. In fact, my humble foundation was the only funding source from India at Harvard. Uh, and I have written a whole chapter describing my experiences at Harvard 20 years ago. Nobody else was funding them. Why I funded them, what was my experience, why I stopped funding them. And after I stopped funding them a few years later, then came all these Indian billionaires taking over that vacuum and Harvard loved it. And these guys have been uh, supporting the very things that I opposed a long time ago. So it's a new game. Okay, so uh, my next question after that, I'll uh, ask Bhutiju to ask his questions. Is that uh, you have uh, made out certain differences? And uh, I'll just uh, read, read that out for the uh, audience. Picking India 1 0, you said old left uh, ideological framework. Then Breaking India 2.0, and uh, again reminding the audience that this is a book that we are talking about Snakes in the Ganga, Breaking India 2.0, and uh, you can buy it from Amazon. You can pre order it, and uh, it will be available, I think, on the 26th of September after the, it is formally launched. So, uh, Breaking India 1.0, Old Left Ideological Framework, Breaking India 2.0, CRT Framework, that Critical Race Theory Framework, extended to Indian victim groups. Number two, uh, Poor Villagers, Target of Conversion or as Foot Soldiers, and Breaking India 2.0, Urban Elites, Targets in Top Posts in Industry, Government, Civil Service, Entrepreneurship. Breaking India 1.0, Stated Goal is to Deliver Basic Needs, food, clothing, education, water, etc. And Breaking India 2.0 stated goal is to deliver development through technology, leadership training at Harvard, prestigious global networking. And number four, targets are isolated from the global nexuses and uh, Breaking India 2.0, Harvard trained Indian intermediaries run end-to-end -end knowledge channel at all levels. Uh, I, I just read it out for the benefit of the audience. Now, uh, my question to you on this, you're talking about critical race theory and uh, morphed into critical caste theory. But uh, we have had this uh, caste theory, basically, in fact, caste theory was devised for India by the Indologists. So uh, aren't the Indologists the original CRT makers? The Indologists uh, headed by people like Max Miller, John Muir, and then uh, all the Bishop Caldwell, uh, G.U. Pope, D. Nobili, and the Dravidian movement. Uh, how is this different from that? So the, the caste uh, uh, divisiveness is very old. That is what you're referring to. But critical race theory is a new kind of theory uh, which maps caste as race, uh, uh, Dalits as the blacks and uh, Brahmins as the whites. Uh, and it superimposes American. It superimposes American history of racism onto India. This is something new. Uh, previously, it was considered a you know Vedic thing and Brahmanical thing and something internal. Nobody said that these are whites and these are blacks. They didn't say that. Now the the change is that it has very big consequences in the United States. It has consequences to the NRIs, to the Indian uh, IT industry in Silicon Valley. They are attacking it for caste because they're saying that. Uh, the most of the people, tech uh, people who are of Indian origin tend to be Brahmins. You know, if you look at all the successful guys, they tend to be Brahmins. They're demanding a caste census in Microsoft, in Google, in, in Facebook, in Apple, in Amazon. They're demanding. And in many places, they're, they're conducting caste uh, briefings, workshops, embarrassing the Indians there. 
and claiming that this whole casteism from India has come into the H-1B visa. And so the entire tech industry should be questioned. Now, this is entering American HR departments in a big way. Uh, these HR departments are instituting new laws saying that casteism should be treated as racism, which has legal implications in the United States. Because there are laws, if anybody accuses someone of racism, there are legal procedures that have to be followed. So now for the first time, if somebody, and there are cases against Cisco, for example, and there are other cases coming, where if somebody says, I was discriminated against on grounds of my caste, then in the United States for the first time, because it's treated as racism, it will have to be prosecuted in a certain manner, which, which didn't happen in the United States. So once these HR departments have started doing censuses of caste and putting caste quotas for the first time ever in the tech industry in Silicon Valley that never existed, then the next step is they're going to start doing it in Bangalore because they have subsidiaries. Bangalore and other, Hyderabad and other places, whether it's a Microsoft subsidiary or a Google subsidiary or a Facebook subsidiary, or whether they're outsourcing, like, like IBM is outsourcing from TCS, those people that they're outsourcing or sourcing from will be required to be cast, uh, compliant with American race, race uh, laws. So this is very new. This is a, there are legal implications, there are social implications, there are corporate implications. And, and the, we are concerned that the competitiveness of Indian tech industry will decline because Indian tech industry will no longer be meritocracy. So one of the books we've criticized is from Harvard, Ajanta Subramaniam. She, her whole book uh, is on this uh, I, IITs as a casteist institution uh, and, and, and a call for dismantling that and a call for changing the laws on H-1B and bringing IIT people and so on, because he says that these are all, this is a, this is a structure that is oppressing Dalits. It's a, and it's a, it's a white Brahmins uh, oppressing the Dalits who are non, uh, you know, uh, the underprivileged. So this is a completely new game. In the law of the United States, it's a new game. Uh, in the tech industry, it never happened before. It's a new game. Uh, and the use of uh, Marxism uh, is a new thing now. Uh, this Marxism... Previously, you know, Marx 200 years ago didn't exist. These Marxism didn't exist. Uh, and so Marxism is a new thing. So original Marxism was only economic class. It was not race as a criteria. It was not white versus black kind of black versus white. It was economic class. It, uh, Marx was very, very clear on that. Uh, then uh, the Frankfurt School in the Second World War expanded it from, uh, you know, economic uh, clash to also discourse. And uh, the means of production that he was fighting was not just economic means of production, but also the means of producing discourse. So cinema, universities, discourse production. They, they started this kind of a theory, which is very, very fascinating. And then this was brought to Berkeley by a German called Herb, Herbert Marcuse. He was a Marxist who came uh, uh, soon after World War II or during World War II he came. And he started this thing in Berkeley creating the Americanization of Marxism. And this Americanized Marxism uh, does not focus on economic strata like the original Marxism. It focuses on race as the criteria. So blacks versus white became the new Marxism. And then this was turned into something called critical legal theory. The critical legal theory came out of a professor of law at Harvard University. So now it became a theory that says that legals, uh, the, the, the way the law is, and the amount of punishment given and the prosecution is unfair to uh, blacks. And it is a structural problem from the U.S. Constitution and all that law. So it was Marxism applied to race, but limited to the legal system. And then a few years after that came critical race theory. The critical legal theory got expanded and became critical race theory. All along, this was very marginal. Only a few leftist people believed in these things, but mainstream people didn't really take it seriously. After Black Lives Matter, George Floyd tragedy that happened. Uh, this got a new momentum and the whole liberal white guilt, all this liberal white guilt that has been in them uh, came out in the form of supporting this critical race theory. And then this critically uh, started bringing in Muslims as a protected class, uh, LGBTQ feminists. So it brought in all these people together uh, as sort of the oppressed and the oppressor is the, the American system, the American structures. And then came Dalits saying, oh, you know, we'll turn it into critical caste theory and we'll apply it to India. So a lot of similar fights, a lot of similar fights that have been going on already in India. You're absolutely right. Now turbocharged with a new theory supported by 
blacks in blacks in america were actually they were gandhians because martin luther king was a gandhian blacks in america were not anti hindu uh, until this whole thing happened uh, whites yes you had uh, people like uh, bobby jindal trying to become a white but now you have suraj jende at harvard trying to become a black this is a very new phenomenon uh, in, you you had honorary whites before uh, like bobby jindal and now you know i i don't know if you've seen the picture of uh, suraj jende we have lots to say on him yes yes uh, he he's a favorite of our uh, future chief justice of india <laughs> yeah yeah so we also have uh, this uh, this uh, this justice of india uh, you know what's his name uh, Uh, Chandrachud Chandrachud Chandra Chandra is total critical race theory sell out uh, in fact we have a uh, we've developed a, which we'll put out in the on our on our channels a 6 7 part 2 minute each series on chandrachud uh, he's quoting suraj jengde he's quoting critical race theory he's applying it to critical caste theory so the critical caste theory is a new fashion in the indian judiciary it has entered the vocabularies of indian billionaires it is entered the vocabulary of all kind of institution and i'm surprised i'm sorry to tell you the national education policy has adopted american liberal arts in I the don't. in the for the sake of being yes. fashionable and being global and all that stuff without understanding what they are getting into the door they brought harvard liberal arts into the heart of india uh, not realizing that the version that is being imported by ashoka universities and many others like them is entirely this critical race theory based so what we are showing to the people in india activists in india is that there is a new lens which is being applied now so you have to understand the new lens to make sense of why there is so much poison against india coming from all these western sources it's because these people have rethought the indian problem in the light of a different framework that they have invented the framework was valid maybe for themselves for america but projecting it on india is a, a new kind of way to think of india it's turbocharged this whole machinery anti india machinery so therefore it deserves to be called breaking india 2.0 all right vibhuti ji your turn i will piggy back on rajiv ji's last statement but i will begin the conversation with vijay ji you know like uh, it's absolutely fascinating because the world is all about control the geopolitics is all about control and what we witness what we are witnessing today is this very deep you know efforts being made to somewhere along the line subdue india this is a control and power game why are we such threats to the west and people who are anti hindu is because we are the most peaceful community in the world not a law and order problem anywhere in the world we are contributory to the societies we go into and we have made massive contributions so despite all this where does the trigger come to destroy us this is all you know it is inevitable it looks like destruction of india and our way of life seems to be the primary goal for all of it where does it emanate from why so i think uh, the uh, the whole end game for you know crt and marxists in general is to essentially dismantle stru- all structures and that's happening in the sadly happening in the us as well so you, the us technological uh, you know uh, prowess it used to be on in, in the cutting edge of technology and now not anymore i think china's fast gaining if you look at institutions like mit and stan uh, and caltech who are, you know which used to be premier institutes um, housing you know the best of technologists um, even that's declining in 10 years you will see that M- mit is actually not on the cutting edge and some institute in china will be uh, thanks to again critical race theory type practices in in uh, uh, hiring scholars in hiring teachers in in giving uh, grants to researchers everything is based on on with this you know is done based on this lens now why india i think the whole marxist agenda is to dismantle i i personally think that uh, india has been a hard nut to crack um, one of the so the marxist way of doing it would be to dismantle one of one's identity 
and in the west uh, in the west and other civilizational contexts you you it's easier because it's either male female they're christian they have a religious identity a gender identity and 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 very minimal things but as in indians are very complex you know our, our culture our thanks to our rishis we have so many identities you know we have a, a kula devata a different bhasha a, a linguistic identity a, a food every village has its own food so which grama you know which village you belong to is an identity you know um, so it, it's all kinds of uh, and that's why even the um, religious conversions couldn't do much uh, uh, but had to sort of appropriate some of these things because people could not let go of the way they sort of even practice religion and that's a form of identity so we uh, we ha- each one of us in india are, are, are ourselves uh, a complex mix of identities and it's very hard uh, to break all these identities and only when you and why should they break identities i think only when you strip up uh, identity as identity essentially gives you grounding solid grounding you know who the person you are whereas if you break identities it's easy to manipulate you so if you don't even know what gender you are and this whole transgender movement that you have it's essentially you know showing that when you strip people especially youngsters of their identity a very core basic identity and confuse them whether they're man or a woman i mean as core as that then they're easily man- you know you can easily manipulate them to be your foot soldiers on the ground so marxists essentially want foot soldiers on the ground to topple existing structures and then bring in uh, you know a so called new world order you know so i guess whether uh, whether hindus are you know uh, doing any harm or not doing any harm is is not the question it's essentially a new world order is sort of being designed on a global a global scale where uh, you know there are there is literature already about you know horizontal histories not vertical histories uh, this whole idea that rajiv ji has talked about you know the civilizational grand narratives that we talk about so those things are things of the past uh, according to marxists and they want to even suraj yangde in fact talks about the fourth world order uh, where he wants to uh, unite you know the the dalits uh, of the world so to speak or or the blacks of the world or the you know the marginalized of the world so uh, so the, the, they they envision a new world order and to end, to make that a reality existing structures have to be dismantled and essentially crt is uh, or critical caste theory is 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 a tool is a, it's an it's a tool for activism which comes in the form of in the guise of scholarship um, you know Uh, or it it's into into corporations or it comes as a, a as a do gooder social justice uh, for all kind of uh, guys but it actually has the end game is to sort of dismantle and it's hard to dismantle existing institutions and uh, structures so the only way to do it is to sort of brainwash uh, the new generation um, get into education get into government get into corporates and uh, and then and thus create uh, foot soldiers who can then do the work for you so i think that would be my uh, you know uh, guess as to w- why they want to do india i think it's it's happening the world over and it's happening at a rap- rapid pace because even america is facing the same thing and it's a it's tra- it's a tragedy to see what we see um in the great institutions in america that are being toppled by this sort of nonsense rajiv ji to you i wanted to uh, you know check with you about this the attack of the critical caste theory the morphing of race theory to caste theory and all that is there any genuine evidence of that but what disturbs me we have done couple of conversations on this issue of caste based scenario here is that while equality labs report gets so much currency which you and i and the rest of the world knows is bogus but at the same time the carnegie foundation research which said that there is no evidence of that this is an evidence based society why is this evidence being ignored is there any authentic actual evidence of the silicon valley practicing caste based discrimination so uh, you've hit on a very important point uh, which also uh, you know people in india need to know these things so so the question that sanjay asked a very important uh, which reveal that people in india there's a knowledge gap about what's going on but don't think that this is just an american thing uh, sanjay uh, i mean i'll come to your answer uh, uh, vibhuti ji but i think that people in india and in all the interviews i have had so far feel that maybe what's new is some kind of thing happening in india in usa but this is what starts at harvard doesn't stay at harvard and what starts in silicon valley microsoft headquarters ends up in microsoft india also and it ends up in all the tech industry so we are talking about a whole new avalanche 
a whole new tidal wave, which the pan IIT better wake up and understand. They have tried to dodge this issue. Uh, so Vibhuti ji, I went to so many people, IIT people, and they're not interested in going public and sticking their neck out and talking about it, even though their industry, where they've made their hundreds of millions, is in threat. So the question you're asking is very important. Uh, basically, politically motivated, uh, politically motivated Marxist-driven uh, reports that these people like uh, Quality Labs have produced, and backed by the theory of uh, uh, IITs being bastions of casteism by Ajanta Subramaniam, Harvard professor, published by Harvard University Press, uh, and backed by uh, Suraj Yengde at Harvard Kennedy School, very prestigious place, and supported by Cornell West, the, the one of the leading African-American uh, ide ideologues today. All of this coming together in a very systematic way, not accidentally, but coordinated way coming from Harvard and going through all over the world. This is a very, very big thing that India needs to wake up and understand. So whether it is authentic or not is not the issue because you see, as Vijay said, the end justifies the means. They, are, they have a certain end goal. The end goal is to establish a new world order. But as I like to say, what they are creating is a new world disorder. They, their goal may be to create a new world order, but what they are creating is a new world disorder. They are dismantling the old structures, but they have no experience creating new structures. You see, but destroying is one thing. You can you can blow up somebody's house and maybe you're standing in the house and you'll also be dead, but you're not that smart. You just want to be destructive, but you have no experience creating something new. These guys have no, never done any, never built anything new, any new institutions, any new uh, structures. They are just into destruction. That is what Marxism calls for. You have a thesis, you create an antithesis and you fight. Uh, you have narrative, you create a counter hegemonic narrative and so on. Now to your question, why is this empirical based society in the United States buying all this? So I've told you their motive, which is to create a disorder. But why are the uh, Americans buying it? Well, Americans are buying it because America is also highly PR oriented, highly oriented towards lobby groups, highly or and this these people are getting very big funding. You know, it's not like some grassroots movement that uh, Sondere Rajan runs in uh, Quality Labs. These people are getting funding from big sources. And that is what we are uncovering in this book. Who are these big sources? What's in it for them? Why are they doing it? And we, in the conclusion of the book, we come up with a very new theory on what is the grand plan on a global scale, which is behind all this. So you can read that. I, I, we want to keep that as a thing that people should read for themselves when they get, they get a copy of the book. But to, to, to your point, uh, the, the facts that they are producing, the, the facts they are claiming are not valid. You are absolutely right. Not only Carnegie report was different, but reports from the Britain, from many other reports from the United States, completely poked holes through this, this, these reports. But these reports are the basis of uh, workshops on caste being taught. I have people from Microsoft. I have people calling me from Facebook, from Amazon, from Apple, Indians, saying that they are being required to sit in workshops called caste sensitivity training. And they find it very embarrassing. They find it humiliating that the culture is being humiliated in front of the whole world. And they have to sit quietly and listen. Because if they open their mouth, they are called racist. They call you are racist. Because uh, you are a white supremacist, you are aligned with the white supremacists, and you are destroying the blacks of India, the Dalits. So they have to sit quietly. They've been told by HR people that you just sit quietly and listen. This is what's going on right now. It's been going on for the past year, and it's accelerating. And, and we are for tracking it because we record all these workshops they do, and we have a whole inventory of videos. And this is, uh, this is partly successful lobbying by the ultra-left. Partly it's guilt. That there is a white guilt. That all these billionaires made a lot of money. They want to be politically correct. They don't want to be attacked. But I think one of the greatest, brilliant things that these guys have done, the Indian Marxists and Dalits have done, is alliance with the blacks. Because this alliance with the blacks, with Black Lives Matter movement, got them right in the door of the Democratic Party. The whole Democratic Party is into this now, into this critical race theory and hence caste. They got, it got them into the corporate sector. It got them into universities in a big way. Uh, there are a lot of bills in the local legislature. I hope in New York it's uh, different, but I know in California and various places, there are a whole lot of bills that uh, are formally, including caste 
as a form of race formally in their in their books of uh, you know how they're going to prosecute people so this is this is a very serious matter uh, that uh, that uh, we are we are now discussing and indians should not trivialize it because this is going to hit india it is already hitting it is already entered chandrachud now if it is entered chandrachud <laughs> he's a he's a he's a harvard trained guy now it's not a coincidence he's a and his uh, dad is an elitist he's also an elitist so they're talking about this uh, dismantling the structures of elitism uh, maybe he should start by dismantling the structures that are of his own life and his own family uh, maybe maybe he should consider you know some kind of a, some kind of volunteering and saying okay i gave up all this elitism because i, I don't believe in it that would at least uh, he'll put his uh, money where his mouth is so to speak but this is entered you know there was no such thing as mahindra center at harvard university when i wrote the first book there was no such thing as lakshmi mittal south asia institute at harvard university when i wrote that book there was no such thing as piramal center piramal professor there was no such thing as reliance ambani chair at uh, stanford so you know these are new things and so you have to take note of these new things and this is where the poison is coming from which india is now facing and brave people like jay shankar are doing a very good job fighting these fires but our job is to find out that why a lot of us are fighting the fires where are the fires coming from who is putting is starting these fires who is putting fuel on the fire because that also we ought to know it's not good enough to go around fire fighting because we'll run out of energy we don't have enough resources to keep fighting fires it's getting worse all the time it, they are starting more fires now we need to know the source and we need to address that thank you uh, okay so uh, let's talk a little about the structure of the work of course before we do that just an aside uh, okay before that i have to request all the viewers to please uh, uh, ask your questions you can ask the questions through whatsapp or through uh, super chat and also remember we are talking about uh, Rajiv Malhotra and uh, Vijay Lakshmi ji's uh, new book which is going to be launched uh, in India on the 26th of September it is called Snakes in the Ganga Breaking India 2.0 and I'll request the desk to please show the cover page also uh, you uh, you talked about Rajiv ji you talked about uh, the dogma that infiltrates and doesn't this dogma uh, actually conform to the a basic epistemology of the west the abrahamic religions as well as marxism i put them all in the same class the epistemology is the same the word is the proof so whatever dogma they churn out is the proof by itself the the uh, what is called the bivalued system so sanjay you hit on a very important point there is a whole section in this book called the church of wokism Uh, we we called it that and we compared the table which says this is a church and this is dogma there is high priest uh, dissent is not allowed uh, you are considered blasphemy if you oppose and uh, the equivalent is cancel culture so you know this whole business of uh, who are the heretics uh, you know uh, so if you look at the pillars of church what makes it powerful what makes it successful you will find exact equivalence in this in this thing so the term church of wokism is not out of place it is a, it literally so they are very dangerous uh, they are very dangerous configurations now i by the way i don't want people to misunderstand us and say okay you're not not helping dalits you don't believe in dalits have a problem dalits do have a problem dalits are being oppressed dalits need more rights i am fully for that but i am not uh, in favor of the dalits going to harvard to get the harvard people to do the danda on india harvard people don't know how to solve their own problems harvard has a whole history of all this stuff themselves and harvard is incapable of solving these problems in the united states so it has really no business to go around scolding india and putting uh, uh, policies of sanctions on india and formulating policies for the us congress and us senate and the state department to go forward on india the, the harvard has so much influence the kennedy school actually trains the political people and the thinkers and uh, think tanks and all that all over the world so harvard is uh, the one that is churning this and sending it out in all directions 
uh, the the plight of the Dalits is a different matter. I am fully uh, in sympathy with the Dalits, but India has answers. India has problems. India has answers, and these answers should be found in the context of Indian constitution and in the context of Indian civilization. And these answers should be found by Indian people within India, and not bring importing Harvard ideology. So that is the disconnect. Is is uh, bringing, as you said, Western universalism dogma, uh, a church-like kind of dogma which has been formulated for export to India as a kind of special poison, if you will, and put into all these snakes and export it, send them back to India. That, I think, is the problem. We are not denying that Dalits have issues, they're legitimate issues. These ought to be solved. We are for it. We would like to... I, in fact, wrote to Suraj Jengde. He never replied. But I said, Suraj, you're a smart guy. You're a charismatic guy. Let's work together. Let's see what the problems are. And let's, all of us Indians, get together and solve these problem. Why you want to go to Harvard and uh, use that in one event after another, anti-India, anti-Hindu, uh, calling Chakracharya, uh, you know, obscene things, bad names and all that. Why you want to abuse your culture, your heritage? Uh, uh, you know, we can all work it out amongst ourselves. No reply from them. So I, I think that there is a difference between the average rank and file Dalit in India and the leaders who've sold out. The leaders who've sold out and become the elites, gone to some fancy places, uh, you need, you, we are questioning those people. That doesn't mean that we are not in sympathy with the rank and file Dalit who's got problems. We certainly are. You actually, you, you, you got the point absolutely right because uh, it's not just the elites who've gone abroad. I can talk about uh, the elites uh, whom I have uh, experienced in my own service, the IAS and the civil services where uh, the Dalits enjoy reservation, but there is not one person who has given up his reservation for the sake of his poor Dalit colleague. Never. Not one case. All the IAS officers, they want, after having served as even chief secretaries, they still want reservation for their sons and daughters. So elitism, if you become an elite, this whole business of reservation, I, I, I don't know where it is going because it is now being cornered by a minuscule class. And there is a problem of elitism within the Dalits. That nobody yes. seems to address, that nobody seems yes. to talk about. That is correct. Uh, and I'll, I'll just now come to the structure of your book, because I haven't read the book, of course, it's not come out, only read an outline. And that outline actually divides it into four parts. So I would like you to highlight uh, those four parts. The first part, of course, is the Americanization of Marxism. Now, this Americanization, as far as I understand, uh, I see that there is a Gramsci model, there is a Derrida model, uh, there is a Frankfurt School model, and there is, of course, a, a liberal model which seems to uh, encompass all, all the other three. Now, which one is working uh, the, what should one say, the best for the American Marxist or the present woke? So, the Americanization of Marxism, which is of chapter one, is basically showing that the Frankfurt School, uh, the, one of their leaders was a man called Herbert Marcuse. Uh, he came to Berkeley, uh, and and uh, this is in the in the fifties. And he brought uh, he Americanized Marxism because he saw race happening in this country, which was not the basis of Marxism in Europe. It was not race oriented. It was economic strata, and he realized that there's a huge opportunity to to create a Marxist revolution by morphing it into race. So the turning Marxism into a race theory uh, was a very new, innovative kind of a thing. And he also came out with the idea of a, of a counter hegemony, that to fight the hegemony, you need to have a counter hegemony. And his idea of counter hegemony became later on what is called cancel culture, which means that, uh, you know, you silence your opponents, you don't even let them speak. Uh, if Unless somebody agrees with you, you don't let them speak, you cancel them, you throw them out, you shout at them. All of this is happening on American campuses, this can cancel culture, and it's entering the American corporate world. Because when they have this, uh, these workshops, uh, you are supposed to just sit there and listen. You cannot argue. So uh, th this, th the Americanization of uh, Marxism is bringing Marxism in a, into American society and bringing it into American social structure of race. That's the Americanization of Marxism. And the next chapter, of course, you talked about it already, the critical 
race theory and morphing it into the critical caste theory yes uh, that is the that is the second chapter and the third chapter is about harvard and uh, of course the last chapter is about the indian elites so uh, i think so i will uh, I, i will suggest that vijaya vijaya in while we writing we took specialized areas you know vijaya focused on the part 3 the final part which is the uh, indian bringing all these things into india so vijaya maybe you want to talk about what are what is the footprint in india roughly where all these american things from harvard have taken root and what is the problem with all that um so okay so the the entire thing with its scholarship or businesses the entire thing leads to activism so universities produce you know we talk extensively about uh, Uh, Harvard, but also uh, you know the theories behind, which are then transferred into places like Ashoka, and uh, where activism. So the end goal is activism, and how Ashoka becomes a distributing channel plus uh, creating new activists on the ground in in the in in the form of students. Now, similarly, corporates uh, have something. You know, there's a whole movement of the ESG, which has S stands for social justice. so environment social justice uh, you know and governance so the governance part takes care of a diverse uh, body of uh, people that are governing and diverse is essentially based on skin color in india's case it would be based on caste i'm assuming uh, and then social justice so uh, before a corporate used to be uh, when you when you invested 100 rupees in a company a publicly traded company um, the fiduciary responsibility would be to you know make sure that they give you the maximum profit so that is only the, the single goal regardless of how they you know there were laws governing the company to make sure that they were doing business in an ethical fashion but uh, or in a legal fashion but the single fiduciary responsibility is to return you know for your investment but now the um, you know that has changed uh, where when you invest in public companies they not only profit is just one of the three other goals and the three other goals are environment s and g social justice and governance so companies so the the rating companies like um, you know eny and all these people are on the esg bandwagon so they make money making sure companies are all esg compliant and uh, so what is social justice essentially uh, so corporates are essentially becoming police of social justice and so who's social justice what social justice so essentially it's all this critical race theory nonsense that becomes the um, the standard for social justice in comp- in in the us companies and their counterparts in india because it's all a global system so uh, corporates are being infiltrated with this as well so activism has entered very beautifully i mean the marxists have done a great job you have to give them that um have entered the corporate you know workplace so uh, you have to comply um, so you know corporate leaders ha- have to just not only do they have to produce a profit but sometimes they sacrifice the profit for complying with esg criteria now um you know so is, is that correct is that a good fiduciary response i mean are there you know conflicts with the fiduciary responsibility nobody asks and these are questions that one should definitely ask because when you're investing so pension funds so you you know people in america have pension funds whose money is being invested in this garbage and it's not producing a return and these are people who are old who are depending on a return and you know there's some social justice nonsense is being uh, you know that these guys come up with yeah they are investing in things like that so uh, essentially that ends up being a way to attack again critical race theory coming into the corporate world and uh, you know now we also have uh, you know uh, religious type things um, you know we we do also predict that you know in the future uh, for religious um, you know they have all these religious committees within um companies and so they have to give voices so soon you'll have i mean i wouldn't be surprised if indian companies uh, ha- are allowing evangelism through uh, you know uh, uh, the company space uh, you know so to give a voice to uh, you know the minority christians who who need a voice to spread the gospel and and that would be a good esg scoring so these are things that are very you know so what does it actually mean social justice sounds good but behind every nice sounding a uh, term that the marxists use uh, you have something lethal uh, that is behind it so essentially the the corporates of the last part of the elites on one side are funding and it we as we we said 
you know, we perhaps knowingly or unknowingly, we don't know. It could also be hush money uh, to keep the social justice warriors off their backs, right? You fund these things so they don't attack them. And then, uh, you know, and use their corporate ground. And Godrej is, you know, with the culture labs, uh, we, you know, we do an entire section on that. Um, it is to sort of train people on these trendy LBGTQ ideas. Not that India hasn't had uh, transgenders. We've, 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 you know, respected transgenders as Mohini, you know, Lord Vishnu himself. And, um, and these, these sort of ideas are not brought in, but the trendy Western ones are brought in. So corporates have, again, become a cesspool for this sort of nonsense through the ESG. Uh, and that's what we discussed towards the end of the, uh, you know, the book where we have elitists who are controlling this up front, up the pipeline with, with producing the scholarship or funding it and, and downstream by giving spaces in their corporations for this kind of activity. And, you know, just adding to that, uh, uh, brilliant summary, adding to that in the final part, which uh, Vijay put together, uh, she's also described uh, some of the major universities uh, by name. And, you know, we are actually naming names, we, to be very honest with you. Uh, we're not generic Harvard doing this with Indian billionaires. We have chapters on billionaire A, billionaire B, billionaire C, naming them uh, dozens of times. And similarly, the universities in India that have been set up by with the Harvard-inspired inspiration and private money uh, that are basically a franchise operation bringing American uh, you know these kind of uh, uh, theories into the into the Indian mainstream and getting a lot of Indian young people involved. These are this is all in the, the final part of the book. Also, I won't name this today because I want people to read this. There is a young version of uh, George Soros. Uh, people keep talking about George Soros, but he's an old guy, and yeah, he's done a lot of harm, and that'll continue. We're not saying that uh, that'll go away, but there's a, there are younger versions of George Soros. They're half his age. They are far worse. They have far more money, billions, tens of billions, some of them. And they are putting their money into what George Soros is doing, but far, in a more serious way. They have infiltrated India in a big time. And we have done a case study where there is one person who's got, you know, hundreds of ventures and uh, thousands of Indian entrepreneurs working in his ventures. And he's involved in, get, in taking, replacing the government services kind of provide, stepping in to mediate legal things, legal disputes, providing the public with services that look like he's a very nice guy, almost like the East India Company stepped in to behave like the government and became the government. Uh, so this is like the new East India Company digital, digital kind of a version of that, providing a lot of services in a lot of uh, uh, poor areas. They've targeted the poor areas because they know that people are vulnerable. All that done in the name of social justice, all of this done and all done in the name of without FCRA requirement, because these are not NGOs. This is FDI. They are calling it investment. <laughs> so it's corporate investment. So you see one of the things happening is that the old NGO model is being replaced by the new FDI model, which is you bring money in the guise of setting up a business. Of course, whether you make a profit or a loss, there is less material to them. They have plenty of money to throw. But you make it look like it's a for-profit entity. And so you can get write-offs for spending money on that. Uh, but you don't have the same disclosure requirements. Uh, NGOs have a lot of disclosure requirements, uh, non-profits. But for-profits do not have the same disclosure requirements as the non-profits do. Uh, and so the accountability of a for-profit company is very different than the accountability of a non-profit company. So when a for-profit company assumes the role of civic society, providing services which are traditionally government, that is a problem. And that is some of, one of the things that ESG is encouraging them to do. All right. I mean, uh, with a, with a, with a, with a follow-up on this matter, because both, both of you have taken, this resembles the story of the David versus Goliath. You have taken up the Harvard University, which is virtually in everything in the United States, from the government to the Wall Street, and they are controlling the narrative. You have also touched upon the aspirational part of the Indian students and Indian parents that Mera Beta, Mera Bacha, Harvard ja hai. But we are behind that. There is such a brainwash going on here. My question is very simple. There will be vicious attacks on this book and the two of you because you are here. And the vicious attacks will come very venomously, if I may add. 
are you ready with your armada of supporters to rebut refute and stand up to this so i'll uh, i'll i'll answer it because and then i then i want then i want uh, vijay vijay to answer also so i've yeah. been in this for 30 years and uh, i've always taken on the biggest biggest uh, role model on the other side the biggest target not some little fringe target so when i took on uh, wendy doniger she was the biggest uh, target uh, when i took on uh, you know sheldon pollock is the biggest target all of these people that i've critiqued uh, with lot of evidence uh, it has created a huge backlash and a huge fight their followers come running after you and so for me uh, it would not have made sense to pick some small time uh, you know university or think tank and give examples i mean harvard is the worst of the lot and so we have to name names and harvard claims to be into free thinking and so i welcome debates with them i welcome if they want to do a rebuttal and we can argue back and forth if we are wrong we are wrong we we'll admit it uh, but let's be gentlemanly let's be civilized i'm i'm so in other words i am going all out saying harvard let's sit down and talk i can go to any forum you can come i can go to your campus you can bring in your experts and we can go through our book and i'll give you my evidence you can give yours my co-author and i were happy to argue so we are going with the integrity and honesty of free thinking genuine intellectuals looking for debate and and that is what harvard claims in their course catalog that they are teaching people teaching young people to do that so we are taking them up on it and and, and so if they if they give us vicious attacks i mean they have plenty of supporters they have supporters in the corporate world they have tens of thousands of indian alumni all over the world who come running after us i know all that i know all that but you know at some point in time and i decided uh, 30 years ago in the prime of my career when i was making tons of money actually making more money than some of these billionaires at that time because they were not billionaires they were small time players and i had succeeded in a very big scale very early in my life i gave up all that in order to pursue the truth in order to pursue my swadharma in order to follow the path of you know our rishis in terms of uh, doing what we can do to give back to society so whether if they attack and all that which which, which is normal if they attack I, i am i prepared with an armada no i don't have any armada but i think they will expose themselves because in this day and age you cannot block a book even if you block the printed copies it's going to be on on a kindle it's going to be uh, in languages different languages Uh, it's not just being printed in india it's going to be printed in many countries you can't go after all that so what are what they will achieve is fueling the fire more people will read it more people will want to if they attack they then people want to know what why they have they attacked you know so i think they're better off i would say the billionaires and harvard all of them are better off saying okay maybe these guys have a point maybe they don't maybe half of it is right maybe half of it is not let's sit down and talk to them let's be reasonable that's what i'm exp- hoping i'm hoping that there are reasonable people on the other side who want to actually sit down with us and understand our point of view look at our evidence we have 1600 more than 1600 end notes we have more than 100 pages bibliography so it is extremely well referenced and by the way we have downloaded all the evidence that we have quoted so that if they delete their videos we have a copy of them if they delete their website we have a copy of them and we are going to take all the evidence which is now sitting on a g drive and we are going to put it up on the website so that people can take type in any evidence any footnote number any an end note number and we'll give them a snapshot of what that evidence is so the evidence can't hide they can't run away with that anymore uh, so this is a pretty watertight case we have made and we know that when you do something so solid so rigorous Uh, so compelling then the uh, people who are very highly armed and weaponized and with a lot of money a lot of credibility they're coming after you too we know that but we are counting on we are counting on the honest truth seeking average human beings to speak up for us when that happens if and when that happens because it's it will be everybody's fight it is not just vijay's fight and my fight we are fighting everybody's fight and it's not just hindus and it's not just uh, indians we are fighting this on behalf of all truth seekers who feel that this bias system must go that this elitism using elitism to take over power what has happened is the vaishyas with a lot of money are becoming the kshatriyas buying off the kshatriyas beg borrow steal and take over political power and the, and we are explaining in the last chapter in the uh, conclusion why they are doing it what's the game for them why is money based power 
the next frontier that they want to do. So that's what we are exposing. So I will now request uh, Vijay ji, please, Vijay, you give your view. And by the way, I have to say that uh, I have a, another back-to-back -back conference. I was told this is one hour long, but uh, I definitely want to hear Vijay, please. Proceed. Yeah, so quickly, Harvard's sort of motto says, Veritas, you know, seeking the truth. So uh, what we've exposed is the truth. Um, although we don't have a big army um, uh, per se, because a lot of people in India are not aware of these things. A lot of people in America, I think we'll have tremendous support in America because um, we sort of show Americans who are also very concerned about these sorts of issues, about the link with uh, India, Indian scholars in producing the sort of atrocity literature, if you will, that's trying to dismantle even American society. Thirdly, I think uh, all of us are clamoring for our children's education, uh, myself included, uh, because th th we have to sort of put them somewhere. Um, uh, now have to realize that, especially for a liberal arts education, are they willing to put up, in a, for example, in Ashoka 10 lakhs a year, uh, you know, for three, four years, uh, and and get a get an activist out of them in the end, uh, or you know, uh, seventy thousand dollars a year, you know, for a Harvard education per year, uh, and and essentially have uh, you know be distanced from your child and not recognize him or her after the four years, because even um, you know Surah Jengde himself sort of prompts the. Uh, the youngsters that there's a you know in these ivy league saying that if you want to if you really support this it's just not good enough to say yes yes you have to be an ally and what does that allyship mean allyship encompasses sort of telling your you know rejecting your own parents uh, because they are casteist so you know this sort of um, you know these sort of uh, you know family conflicts is what all this causes as well so one has to ask as a parent are you willing to cough up so much for for, for a liberal arts degree because everybody you know is so proud that your child is going to harvard and this is uh, something that we all have to sit back and think and and only then can we you know can we uh, reinvent education itself for for all of us you know overseas as well as uh, uh, in india uh, okay. Do we have time for audience question, Rajivji? So, you know, uh, we have uh, four minutes to finish the one hour. Let's say we go five minutes over. So can we wrap it up because I have another... Yes. Yeah, so so um, I'll just look. ask you uh, one uh, simple question. But you know, you know, after I, leave, audience question. after I leave, uh, Vijay can continue. There's no problem. I mean, I just... Uh, okay. Okay. That will be good. That will be good. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's perfect. Uh, so before you leave... Uh, do you think that uh, anybody in the government of India would read this and uh, uh, would actually follow up on it? Well, you see, <laughs> I mean, I hope so. But you know, what's happening is I have a track record of predicting things, which I did in uh, many of previous books that they came out. Uh, now, a lot of uh, the Breaking India original book uh, created a whole wave of uh, scholars and uh, you know, Manthans and uh, YouTube channel, your channel, basically taking those breaking India ideas and giving a lot of examples and a lot of space to different people. So a lot of activists have come out of that. A lot of, uh, you know, think tanks, new, new kind of thinking have come out of that. Government has become vigilant. So I understand and we have credibility that what we are saying uh, should be taken seriously. Uh, so uh, there is every reason to believe that they ought to look at all this stuff. And now we have a we have a star studied a tour of uh, you know 15 or so events in four cities and then we, uh, in India uh, and we are hoping that these people be, being important people will read the book and I think they will the book has already sold out with the first print run was 10,000 copies with the publisher told me that 13,000 orders have been received and so they put in a second print run and we haven't even launched the book so I think that uh, when a when a book becomes so so widespread and the, and we haven't even launched the uh, the Kindle version yet so, uh, and we are going to launch a Hindi version also, uh, you know, I, and when we come to US, we're going to go around so many places and do about 40, 50 events in the US also, US and Canada and then Europe. It's not going to be easy for them to ignore it. And I think uh, government people will, will find it, uh, they'll be looking like fools if the public knows things that the government should know, but they don't know. Well, they, so they'll be public. They have no problem. They have no problems looking like fools. As long as they can <laughs> I I know that having served there for 35 years. <laughs> okay, Rajivji, I think we can let you go. After let me ask me uh, ask the audience to um, uh, 
give you one or two top questions and after that we can let you go okay well, well, give me one question uh, it's uh, it's uh, six seconds left but anyway one uh, one minute left sorry give me one question i'll answer and then i'll run okay and then we'll uh, talk to vijay ji on those questions yeah uh, okay let's have the top question okay this uh, cat leo isn't this the case of frankenstein's monster this is going to hurt meritocracy in us india has already shown us the hand of uh, hand to us foreign policy yeah uh, us is being dismantled uh, to become second class to china for many reasons one of them is that they're dismantling their own meritocracy and uh, using these uh, kind of arguments uh, and uh, the point is that india has got enough problems already but you know on the one hand us and india are aligned in, against china they have a lot of reasons to be aligned on the other hand there is this uh, ultra left part of the united states that wants to put pressure on india it's like the church was putting pressure uh, using the right wing americans now this ultra left wing are putting pressure using these new kind of theories using these new kind of theories sorry uh, and so india is going to have to face all this so, so being aware reading this book and being aware where is it coming from what are the limitations of their theory how do we counter argue because in, in this book we don't just whine and complain when we take a book by janta subramaniam take it apart give counter arguments when we take uh, the, the the these uh, equality labs reports we give counter arguments when we take a whole chapter on suraj jende we give counter arguments so like that and when we took a look at all the indian billionaires at harvard and all that what they are doing we critique it we tell you what is flawed what is wrong with it so in a sense we are uh, giving we are weaponizing our team our side with arguments to rebuttal and so that's what i think what we would like to happen is that many more people like you guys who are interviewing us should start raising these questions and put the other side on the defensive that's what we are hoping will happen and at some point in time the government people Uh, we'll have to uh, wake up. I think the gov. My pred- prediction is the government people are going to be taking this seriously right away. That's my prediction. Okay, uh, let's be very hopeful and optimistic. Thank you very much, Rajiv ji. We can let you go now. Thank you, and, uh, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, and uh, please continue with Vijay ji. She has a lot to say, and I'm so. Glad. One of the things I'll tell you, one of the greatest things in this book. is i have the most brilliant co-author i ever worked with so vijay thank, congr- thank you for thank all you, the, thank you and yeah. for putting up with me and all kind of stuff and i you know my being a tough guy and all but you know thank you so much uh, you are absolutely amazing and i i am leaving very happy very confident that this movement is in good hands with vijay And no, no. I also have to say that it's been a great experience working with uh, Rajiv ji. There's just so much about being a kshatriya one learns. Um, you know, uh, you know, after doing something, you just sit back. Whereas, you know, Rajiv is always thinking. So, um, so it's a great, and I don't say it in a perfunctory way. You know, uh, it's been a great way to learn so much. Just being with somebody who thinks in in such a brilliant way. So thank you thank you everybody and namaste thank you, thank, thank, namaste. thank you rajiv ji thank you rajiv ji thank you all good wishes for the success of your book thank you so much and thank we you. continue with the questions and we'll see you in delhi have a cup of coffee together sure okay thank, thank you. you okay vijay ji so yeah, you got to feel all the questions <laughs> <laughs> sure so let's start with them गुरु राज देश पांडे थैंक यू अभिजीत कुलकर्णी नमस्ते राजीव जी यू आर ऋषि ऑफ अर करेंट टाइम्स आई नेवर टेन टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट मेक्स अस इंडियंस यूनिक दैट वी टेन टू हैव सिपॉय मेंटालिटी फॉर द 300 इयर्स एट लीस्ट व्हिच अदर नेशंस डोंट हैव आई थिंक सम ऑफ इट इज बेसिकली आवर डाइवर्सिटी एज़ वेल एंड वी हैव नॉट बीन ट्रेंड यू नो वी डोंट हैव यू नो वन बुक वन चर्च वन लीड यू नो Uh, that guides us um so in a way that is good because that's how we s- survive with this sort of open architecture framework but in another way the disadvantage is that i- we we all try and do our own things and we are not coordinated and and hence in some ways become uh, vulnerable to see these sorts of attacks but uh, 
you know, uh, Rajiv ji spoke about the attack, the Cisco uh, case that everybody knows about on caste, uh, caste discrimination. Uh, I think it's a wake-up call to a lot of in, uh, Indians because only when something hits, you know, we are, we're always very good at virtue signaling, uh, saying, yeah, yeah, we're all the same and, you know, and we don't want to comment on something and just sort of look the other way as, as Hindus uh, and NRIs. Uh, we just sort of don't want to get into a controversy. But when it comes to your own home, when, it, when you get attacked personally out of just out of the blue, when you were just minding your own business, then you, you wake up. So I think the Cisco case in a lot of ways is a wake up to uh, so many successful, you know, uh, tech entrepreneurs and billionaires who've just sort of uh, pushed it all to a side or just been sort of uh, squeaky clean and not worried about all this, it's coming to bite them. Because ultimately, that's the whole, you know, the CRT wokeism, that's what it does. You you have to essentially, you can't just say yes and, and, and virtue signal, but you have to actually act and be an ally. And until you do that, they come after you. So I think in a way, it's a good thing that uh, now Hindus will begin to respond because it's coming home to their own, you know, households. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shiva Satya. <laughs> Shiva Satya. Isn't targeting Indian Silicon Valley tech space usual USA use and throw attitude at play? Now that the ecosystem is built, kick out the useful idiots. <laughs> um, I don't think it's um, it was meant to sort of use the Indians and 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 do it because I think conservative India still uh, looks at the Asian minority as a the model minority and uh, and because you know they 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 want people whoever it is uh, to who builds the nation here for them. So I think um, uh, but the left is into this dismantling game and in fact <laughs> University of Maryland. Uh, counted uh, Asians as whites, you know. Uh, the, it, it, so, it, so there is that aspect also for discrimination. So it's actually, it's the far left that is thinking like that. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, the, the tech billionaires who run social media groups and all of that have bought into this, uh, like all elites uh, in the corporate world, and they have to sort of uh, appease them it's like hush money just so that you you stay off my back and continue you know allow me to continue my work uh, and that's what's happening and that's why they succumb to this and and you end up the indian becomes uh, a victim in all of this because we haven't really stood up if you look at the indian muslims uh, they have sort of you know uh, garnered support as a minority there's always every day every week there's a congressional hearing of some sort and they're making, uh, you know, their voices heard. Whereas the average Hindu is just asleep. Um, so like I said, you know, it'll come to bite you sooner or later. There's just no virtue signaling anymore. The times of virtue signaling is over. So, uh, uh, but we, we, we are not victims either. I think we are paying the price for, for not taking on um, the Hindu causes, Hindu rights uh, for all these years. So it's just karma, you know, sort of playing its uh, hand. All right. Uh, next. Bharat Ved Prakash. Why is Bharatiya diaspora so quiet on it? I think there are a lot of people. Um, they're not quiet. I think we're waking up to it. Like I said, uh, in India, people are not aware of what's going on. Uh, even about Justice Chandrachur, very few, very handful of people know about it. Uh, about what's going on. Um, the, in the diaspora, you have, uh, you, you have Hindus that are waking up to it. You have, a, you have a few handful of organizations on the ground fighting this fire and that fire, like this uh, dismantling Hindu phobia conference that we had. Uh, you know, we found lots of people who, who woke up to it and started you know, putting out fires. But I think we have to be a little more strategic and systematic in how we we approach this whole thing. You have to know, you know, like uh, Rajiv Ji says, where are the snakes? Who's producing it? What's their end game? Uh, who's funding it? So that you can stop this uh, this sort of nonsense coming out, uh, you know, into society. Because it's out to dismantle families. It's out to dismantle, you know, through, uh, you know, we saw in the NEP also, you know, I, uh, where you had uh, this trans training, you know, uh, by outside experts, so to speak, 
So all these things are are trickling in, you know, very quietly. And before you know it, your 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 you know your child would be exposed to all of this at a very young age. Um, in fact, we do an entire not to go off the topic from this question, but we go into a, a whole section of how Ashoka is in uh, Ashoka University is in the, at the cutting edge of trying to bring this American style, you know, social and emotional learning into the classroom. Uh, so by essentially teaching children about uh, sexuality at an earlier and earlier age, because at the at the core, the uh, critical race theory people do not believe in um, childhood innocence. So childhood innocence is under attack because it's a patriarchal thing. Only the privileged can afford childhood in innocence, and not everybody else uh, can. So these sorts of attacks are coming very soon. So we, if we don't stop it right now, it's going to come into your family. Your children are going to be like strangers that you have, you know, you, you, you would be aghast at what they turn out to be, just putting them into the school. <clears throat> Shiva Satya, CRT wokeism is a headache to USA too. Why hasn't the almighty FBI CIA, CIA do anything about it? Universities being Marxist means Cold War was won by USSR. Uh, Vijayaji, just one caution. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are lots of questions. Uh, if you want to stay with us for as long as you want, we are willing. But uh, maybe you will keep the answer crisp, short, and hard-hitting as you are nicely okay, keeping sure. it. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, CR, CRT is uh, hitting the US. But at the, in fact, the American conservatives, if you just sort of see what they have to say, they in fact say that the FBI itself is sort of compromised into this CRT nonsense. In fact, the US Navy has training programs on the yeah. CRT nonsense. So uh, I, I guess that everybody, all institutions are comp compromised. So that's the short answer. Thank you. Okay, next one. Uh, Jay, India must pursue a break them now policy. You've had invasive cultures poaching on Sanatani Hindus for 1400 years. Isn't it time to turn the tables? I guess, uh, you know, until we are in a position of power um, and authority, we can't do that. We don't control the narrative at all. We are constantly paying defense and even that we don't play too well. So until we have, you know, we are like China having Confucius Institutes overseas. We are controlling the narrative overseas. That's not, uh, that's not something we can do. It's wishful thinking. Project Hindu Kush, pranam to all. Do we now have an unbreaking India 2.0 to look forward to in not too distant future? Sanjayji, that's for Sanjayji, that's what, that was <laughs> Sanjayji's uh, uh, question. <laughs> well, my next project is all religions are not the same. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> unbreaking India 2.0, maybe in some distant future. It came 10 years after unbreaking India 1.0. The unbreaking <laughs> India. <so> the, yeah. <laughs> uh, Vishwas Indraganti. I bet the Indian businessmen will run away once they have to start implementing quota in their own business. What do you say? Absolutely not. In fact, they are encouraging uh, quota. If you look at, um, uh, they're, they're looking all kinds of uh, quotas. So uh, even the Tatas are not, because this is part of the ESG rating that I spoke about. So if you want a good ESG rating, you better comply. Otherwise, uh, your, your, your stock price and everything will be rated on your ESG score. And if you don't do well on ESG, then, you know, you don't survive. So uh, they have them by the, you know, Color. ESG is the uh, is the whip. Okay, Shiva Satya suggestions to counter this. What's the Sarva Payagam? I did not Sar understand. Sar what is this? Sar Payagam. Well, oh, what's, to what's counter the... this. To what? What do you do to uh, counter this? I guess first is awareness, and like I said, we have to take over um, all institutions. Education, especially of the younger generation, we have to make sure education that we we have total control over it to to understand what needs to be taught, and um, and then block all these 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 holes as as you know as the first step of uh, defense before we can go on the offense. Next, Praveen Singhania, Rajivji Pranam, thanks to your original works and channels like JD. 
these problems are being being and will be well understood in a large section of india have you also suggested poison pills in your book to automate our responses to avoid firefighting i don't think this um book has uh, you know the classic poison pills that rajiv ji talks about uh, but it it does expose um, so this book is essentially i mean as it is it's almost 900 pages so it it just gives details on how this thing uh, it pervades pervades all parts of society institutions government and all of that um, so that's sort of the goal of the book was to sort of show um, how extensive this ideology has already spread and and who is spreading it but um, there aren't any you know sort of solutions for it other than in in in, in counter arguments that we give along the way next uh, this was answered by rajiv ji i think adi cool thank you shalvin shalke hindus are a global minority fighting on almost a lost war if you want to survive fight like the jews you need to win every time and they only once so what's the question here sanjay question is that why are you why are you fighting a defensive war uh because the narrative is not in our hands you know uh we are in a position of weakness we should understand that and everybody knows it uh so we you know we are we're all over the place we don't even know who you know uh for example we don't even know how how china has infiltrated india in so many different ways and some the book exposes some of that you, even a country like saudi arabia manages its um students really well yeah uh whereas we don't so um so we are in we are all over the place and so we can't we can't think about winning if we have not even got we haven't studied the enemy we we don't have a strategy internally so when we get all those pieces together of course we can but we need to get, we need to sort of do this jagruti you know making people aware of what's going on and then automatically there will be warriors that show up okay next one jk krishna can we fund send this book to all supreme court judges especially next cgi and promote through rss bjp ministers and mps if you have any suggestions of doing that please uh, email rajiv ji and you know um we trying to do something internally ourselves but if you have further ideas please feel free to email him yes i'll be looking forward to those uh, clips on chandrachur <laughs> i've done it so uh <laughs> <laughs> that was very interesting and then uh, i can maybe uh, use those clips and write to chandachur and open letter or some such thing that will work adventure time is china big funder of crt because they cannot take on us head on so they decided to slow poison us and their allies or partners like europe and india uh interesting question um so china funds crt for the rest of the world but not for china so china is so clever we have a, we have this in the book as well as to how they manage um education you know there was a edtech company like baiju which they just made overnight they told them to make them uh, uh, become a non profit so the the ccp could control it um and china essentially uh, they stopped training people in english uh because all these years they used to because they wanted us business but now they sort of you know exceeded all their own expectations so they said enough and en enough is enough everybody learn mandarin so anyway so china china supports crt outside china because it dismantles other countries makes them weak but within china it's totally banned yes but then crt the critical race theory the its original cultural marxism It was an invention uh, from Europe. In fact, the entire Marxism is uh, invented. So when I say West, yeah, Western when I say Europe. CRT, I mean this all this woke culture that it it manifests. As. Everything comes from Western Europe, so it's all white privilege. It is. Parimal Alok. It is evident now how the reservation policy has adversely affected Bharat. But since it is a vote bank, no party will do away with it, even though as per constitution it has expired. alas bjp through its actions seems a strong supporter of reservation policy is there a way out for bharat out of this rut it is esg compliant 
Yeah. <laughs> they created institutional framework. They created the narrative to do that. You know, you fall. For Actually, it. reservation is not even um, a problem right now. So it's even so the whole idea they're talking about, which we talk about in the book, uh, what CRT asks for is equality of, of outcome. So they've said we've had reservations, and then we still see that people, uh, you know, so if there are the, the outcome is not equal by by caste or by race or whatever. So what could be the problem? So we, you know, so what happens is, so they say essentially, CRT essentially says that the the, the institutions itself has structural racism, casteism built into it because it's the institutions were built by white uh, or in India's case, um, Brahmanical patriarchy. So the institution needs to be dismantled because that itself, uh, because you know, whatever input you give, the output will always be unequal, and therefore. Uh, you know, that's a sign that something is wrong with the institution and needs to be dismantled. So reservations actually are fine. Uh, I mean, <laughs> because now they're asking for equality of outcome and not just opportunity. Actually, it doesn't actually uh, conform with the fact, you know, what we have today, what we call the other backward caste communities. Uh, in South India, except the Pallavas and the Kadambas, all the ruling dynasties belong to these groups. Right. So this entire theory of uh, Brahmanical patriarchy, actually you can stand it on its head. And right. even, Manusmriti, yeah. and even Manusmriti, who was Maharaja Manu, he was not a Brahmin. <laughs> so, a lot of what I call complete illiteracy about India that goes on in the CRT business. Anyway, next question. Mother Moha. Oh, wonderful. I think Daridram is a right proposed for non believers and women in true card books. I think we should ask repeated questions how they justify. Okay, it's a suggestion. So I, I, I leave it at that. Uh, Rajivji, when can we expect the ebook on Amazon? I think with in a month's time uh, after the book launch. Okay, Vivek Tahiyaji, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for inviting the most respected scholar of India, Rajiv Ji and Vijay Ji. Please, Rajiv sir, we need you more frequently on Jaipur Dialogue. Great discussion, Jay Sri Ram. Thank you, Vivek Ji, for your kind words. Praveen Sri Ram. Sriram Moju, Rajivji and Sanjiji, thank you for your great work. How can I contribute to your work? Data scientist by profession can handle anything related to analytics, pattern recognition, etc. Jai Sri Ram. Thank you, Praveenji. You can please uh, uh, write to our WhatsApp number, which is scrolling below, and we will take it from there. Shauvik Shikadar Arya, Rajivji, I have been in search of you to ask a question for a long time. Was widow remarriage reform act by British also a rumor and blunder like Sati? Truth? I Jari, would, would like I would, to ask I would, No, I w I'm not an expert on this. So okay, I... so I, I will attempt it. I will attempt it. Uh, okay, widow remarriage is uh, as old as the Manusmriti. Please read Manusmriti. Please uh, uh, go through the episode that uh, I did with Professor Bharat Gupta. So uh, to say that widow remarriage is something that the British introduced is completely false. Of course, later on, uh, a lot of behavioral distortions did creep now, cre cre did creep in into the society, as will happen with uh, any uh, old society. Uh, but even there. The reforms were carried out by people like Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, who was the one who uh, was actually in the forefront of uh, this widow remarriage movement. The British uh, are, of course, a very great at appropriating credit. So they did that. Mohit, question. I understand the Indian government's indifference uh, makes this fight really difficult. But is the government naive? Uh, does it have different priorities or is it simply not powerful enough to get directly involved and take on the breaking India forces? I think there's, you know, I mean, we can all sit and blame the government for not doing enough, but I think they have their hands full with every day there's, there's a fire that's going on. So, uh, you know, so I do, I do understand. 
I think uh, a, a book like this is sort of a ready reckoner uh, for, of due diligence, like a due diligence report. So uh, it, this is not so much to you know point fingers as this one's doing something wrong or, or a corporate uh, honcho somewhere is doing something wrong. If it can be taken in a positive light as a ready, you know, as a ready reckoner, somebody who's done the due diligence oh, for me, uh, and, which I don't have the time to do, uh, th then that would be a positive outcome. So I would not blame the uh, Indian government because I, I, I couldn't do their job even for a day. But, uh, uh, but this is something that we can all work towards, you know together on. Well, uh, having been in the government for 35 years, uh, I'll just add to supplement Vijayaji's answer. And my answer is, every government in the world is naive. <laughs> Only some leaders are not. <laughs> Without exception, yes. every government is naive. Only some leaders here and there, they are not. And they're the ones who bring changes. Satish, the Tamil Tamilian Brahmins and many from the South have a dark skin. How the hybrid Marxists be able to equate them with the whites of Europe and America? I, I think with critical critical uh, caste theory is essentially so the, the the that sort of a marker is for for the U.S. Uh, and if, and so they have this dilemma in the U.S. as to how do you uh, you know where do you put Asians because they are not white. But uh, they've very smartly said that the Asians uh, share uh, white uh, values. Therefore, they are also sort of honorary whites and should be treated as such. <laughs> so uh, Honorary uh, whites with all the uh, disadvantages, but no privileges. Right, right, right. <laughs> right exactly. So, it, it, so you know, the, all these theories are basically bunkum, you know, uh, because the subjectivity rules, there's no objectivity of any sort. Um, it's all about lived experience of a person that that, that at the end of and at the end of the day counts. So, um, so you really can't argue with them. And if you argue, you, you know, you're, you 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 become a casteist or a racist or a bigot or whatever. So it, it's just you know willy nilly something and and to to get the objective that they that they have in mind. So there's no point uh, using logic. Yeah, it's a dogma. Using logic. It's a dogma. That was a good yeah, one. I, I asked that question about epistemology. <laughs> the epistemology is dogmatic. It's all dogma. That's right. Next. Free mind. Is this ESG rating a non Islamic version of halal certificate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a Marxist uh, certificate. And and the stock market, it's, it's a globally accepted. So, halal, at least, there are just groups that accept, only the Muslims accept it. Um, whereas with this, uh, it, it's on a global scale, and that's how stocks are rated. And uh, everybody in between is making money on this you know, ESG bandwagon. And um, uh, you know, uh, so it's actually worse than halal, I would say. Okay, Sarpayagam Shiva Satya Sarpayagam is Sar Sarpa Sat Satra that King Janmay did. Okay, 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 oh, okay. okay. Sarpayagam, Sarpa Yagam, actually. Mm -hmm. Sarpa Satra, okay. Ram, are there any top tier universities in the US that are free from Marxists and woke influences? Um, there aren't, uh, but there are efforts now. There's a, a university called the University of Austin that uh, where all the um, uh, the pariah professors who who you know who spoke out against wokeism on campus and free, you know and cancel culture, they've joined together and they've started something called the University of Austin. Uh, they've just about started summer programs um, where they say you know it's uh, it's just based on merit and academic so even merit you know uh, you have to sort of have an adjective for merit whether it's academic merit or like other merit you know in america but anyway so these guys have gotten together and there's a university of austin that's uh, uh, beginning to um, you know sort of you know start on uh, on principles that are totally different uh, peter bogosian who has written a forward for uh, our book um, is one of the founders of the university of austin um, you know, in this new effort. Okay, next. Akash Chauhan, Namaste. Hindi Sanskaran kab tak aane ki sambhavna hai? When do we expect a Hindi edition? I think very soon, in two, three months, once this whole um, launch is over, I think Rajiv ji will get that started. Okay. 
Shivanand Sheshapanavar. Vijayaji, we know the book is 800 plus pages long. Can you tell us about the number of videos planned? <laughs> Not 800, I'm sure. Uh, I think we uh, are, what, what we're thinking of doing is, so the 800 pages, a lot of it is, is uh, you know, to the end you have, uh, you know, references and citations. Uh, but we also have diagrams for you to understand, um, you know, what's going on. Uh, videos, we are planning to do two minute videos on, you know, sort of Twitter bites that you can sort of take in and a series of those uh, and knowing um, you know Rajiv ji he he'll do an excellent job of, of you know if you listen to his long form in various places I think he'd cover most uh, aspects of the book so you can get you know get the highlights Sim Singhania wokeism USA wokeism in USA is another fantastic breeding ground for jihad just like secularism in India. Jihadis are neither woke nor secular, for sure. How to tackle that? The, uh, again, <laughs> Marxist um, you know, ideas bring in these marginalized communities. So they're not necessarily that they are, you know, uh, I mean, so for how do you have the far left in bed with uh, um, Islamists is beyond me, but, uh, but, it, but it's a common cause to, dis to, to you know, till they dismantle. So you can't dismantle them till, I mean, you can't uh, avoid these, um, you know, these uh, woke uh, people, uh, you know, getting together with Islamists and all of that until uh, they dis dismantle the mainstream, you know, the, the dominant patriarchal, you know, structures that they, that they deem are, are the ones that are oppressing. So they will continue to do this. Uh, a, a good a good thing would be to have a counter of you know conservatives world round who want to build their societies in you know in whatever form uh, get together and share ideas. But again, like the Hindus, the conservatives world over don't get along uh, for various reasons. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this session. So we have to thank all the viewers first, and then uh, okay. Last question, what is counter narrative to critical caste theory? I think there is no counter narrative as such to critical caste theory. I think a lot of it is um, because that talks about breaking identities. And, and I think if we stick, go back to valuing what our traditions have given us in terms of keeping our identities, if we can teach each of our children the, the uh, you know, our, our matru bhasha, our uh, traditions, our kula devata, our grama devata, our ways of, you know, cooking food, uh, traditional vessels, just keep it a living culture, right, uh, that makes our, you know, uh, identities stronger. I think, uh, you know, that would be the the, the way to counter it, because then nothing can break your identity, not now, not ever. So, And there's one more uh, question that has just come up. Uh, there is a query, actually. Ma'am, you mentioned University of Austin as free from woke influence. This is Ram asking the question. Is the same as the University of Texas at Austin or something? No, else? that is part of so no, a uni Austin University. Check it. Uh, yeah, it's not the University of Aust uh, Texas at Aust uh, Aust uh, because that's part of the Texas uh, state uh, universities. It's not uh, UT Austin. It's uh, Austin University, maybe something like that. Um, just check it out. It's a, it's a new it's a new thing in Austin. Uh, right. And uh, with that, thanking all viewers. And uh, I thank Vibhuti ji and thank Vidya ji so much. Thank you so much. We had a wonderful session, a long one, but really worth it. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pleasure Hind, to meet you and Vatram. thank you, Rajiv ji and Sanjay ji, as always. For... Yeah, thank you, Sanjay ji, and thank you, Vibhuti ji. Very nice to meet both of you again. Jai Hind, Vande Mataram. Namaste. Jai Hind, Vande Mataram. Thank you.